All right. So um, for those that haven't met yet, no, I've met both of you. My name is Dane Johnson, I'm a student physical therapist from APU, and today I'll be doing an in-service on exercise prescription as it pertains to strength training in the PT clinic. A couple of objectives here before we get started. Um, just to develop a deeper understanding of the benefits of strength training, um, more informed of the current research surrounding strength training, as well as learning a patient-centered approach for prescribing strength training in our uh, clinic. So before we get started, what exactly is strength? It is the production of force in a single effort. And so with force, it breaks down into mass and acceleration. So moving something over a given period of time to produce a movement, such as picking up a grandchild or child from the ground, standing up from a chair, carrying groceries into the house, putting dishes away in the top shelf, lifting a spoon to your mouth, or sitting upright in a chair. All require some level of strength. And different variables here can all impact our strength output. Uh, so repeatedly, the more frequently we repeat, you know, repeat it, uh, a civic movement over time can impact our strength output later on. You have to lift 50 boxes. The first box you most, most likely have more strength to do in the last box. Um, speed can obviously impact that irregularly. So carrying a giant 10 pound jug can be a little awkward versus a 10 pound weight can all impact our strength distribution and output. Um, balance imbalance, uh, fresh fatigue, obviously um, how recovered or fresh muscles are. Um, distracted focus, mind can play a big part of that, especially with new movements, right, might require more mental capacity to focus on that exercise. Um, and then time, and obviously with us being in, in physical therapy, pain can definitely put, impact our, our strength output. So a little question here before we get started. Do we as PTs push our patients hard enough in the strength training portion of their rehabilitation plan of care? And furthermore, do we actually implement research-based strength training and with how many of our patients. And to imply that, uh, what would happen to long-term health if we legitimately answered yes? It, here is our infographic of what can actually be imp uh, impacted by strength training. So on the left, we have things that de are decreased, so risk of mortality. You actually have a higher life expectancy with strength training. Cardiovascular disease, we know heart disease is one of the biggest killers. Um, hypertension, stroke, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cancers, actually colon and breast cancer have been shown to had decreased risk uh, with strain training. Anxiety and depression, bringing in the mental health aspect. Hip and vertebral fractures are decreased, uh, as well as joint and back pain, decreased stress, falls, dementia, osteoarthritis, and osteoporosis. We've actually had a patient here who, after three years of strain training, reduced her osteoporosis down to osteopenia. And then on the right are some things that kind of improve with uh, strain training, cardiorespiratory health, uh, muscle, bone, tendon, cartilage health, growth hormones, and that's a big one when it comes to recovery and um, being able to produce more you know, HGH for our, you know, our body to, our body's tissues to recover post-injury. Weight maintenance, body mass, body composition, just overall improved skeletal muscle mass to improve our body's metabolic capabilities to lower blood sugars and burn calories, uh, improve sleep, quality of life, and mental health. And oftentimes we hear patients, I wish I was 20 years younger. What's the magic pill? What's the fountain of youth? I would argue this kind of is that. And with that being said, exercise is medicine, and with medicine comes proper prescription. Um, and so furthermore, with kind of the infographic of how strength can impact all those different variables of life, kind of imp um, implementing the biopsychosocial method, um, I've seen a lot here with COVID kind of related symptoms. Patients talk about depression, isolation, not being able to go to the gym, and how kind of all that mental health aspects kind of played into their kind of pain and stuff. And that kind of comes into play here with how strength can improve kind of the mental aspect as well as the physiological responses that may be going on there. And so bringing the evidence of what strength training is, Here's our load, 50 to 85 percent of a one rep max. Two to three sets of six to 12 reps performed two to three days a week. And to improve strength in a specific muscle, so say the glutes, you're performing one to two multi-joint exercises per that major muscle group. So for the glutes could be bridges and squats or hip thrusters and deadlifts. Um, shoulders could be 
you know, it could be overhead press and a bench press, two big primary movers. And that heavy loads are superior for muscle strengthening. So with that, how many patients do we identify strength as an impairment, yet we aren't implementing this evidence-based strengthening? And so then what are we doing to improve that strength in, our, in those patients? So then what are our limitations when it comes to actually implementing this type of strength training? Kind of looking further more into the research, some of the limitations we may face is that our own kinesiophobic beliefs, our own fear of movement, not knowing how to lift weights on our own, actually negatively impact the patient's ability to improve their strength and lift with their full capacity. You know, we all go through extensive schooling and training on how to understand movement, but do we really know how to understand load to meet the demands that life places on our body? Because every single movement we do in life has some sort of resistance in it. It could be the weight of our arm. It's gravity and acting upon our body. There is load placed on us with every movement we do. And so with that, research also shows that low load, high effort can improve our muscle gains more so than just pure volume. And that doesn't mean low load, high effort is grunting and straining with the yellow TheraBand. That effort is moving properly under a low load with enough repetitions to produce muscle fatigue. Because with the adequate fatigue, you get muscle strength gains. It's kind of like the Wolf's Law for muscles. The more force you place on it, healthy force you place upon it, it adapts properly. And so this, this is some ways we can kind of more effectively uh, prescribe um, exercise to our patients. One uh, application is reps and reserve. And reps and reserve is how many more reps do you have until failure? So say, hey, you're going to do, I want you to do a set of 10 on these bicep curls. They get to that set of 10, how many more reps do you have in reserve? I could have done another 30. I, was not, I wasn't fatigued at all. Okay, well, if they could have done another 30, that puts them at 40 reps. That's not within the 6 to 12 reps. So obviously that weight is not conducive to their strength training. Auto-regulation also showed that with advanced weightlifters, someone put an auto-regulated kind of weight, ma weight maintenance where based upon their own reps and reserve on a specific day, based of, of mood, hormones, different types of things impacting them, they could adjust their weight accordingly. It led to improved intensity, higher efforts, and greater strength gains than just fixed load prescription, just working at a percentage of a one rep max. So that kind of shows that reps and reserve is very effective at proper dosage with patients. And, you know, they say that two times a week, sometimes we're only seeing patients once a week, but tubing, resistance bands, resistance bands are effective as a kind of supplementation alternative method when we work to kind of that fatigue muscle plateau around three to five reps from failure. And so if they come in the gym once a week, they do the strength training here and we create a conducive ATP with tubing bands to send them home with to also get that second, third day in as well. So putting into practice, you know, the easiest way to say is how many more reps do you have in reserve after they finish that set? And the key here with pain and patience is without having a flare-up because, you know, oh, I can, I can do all this, but without having to pay the price tomorrow. You know, we don't want to have patients coming back the next day. I had a flare-up and you know, I, I couldn't do couldn't move the rest of the week. I couldn't do my other days of strength training. Um, and then it's also, so what kind of reps and reserve we're looking for? Three to five reps from failure is kind of like a good a good load. Maintain that. They're at a proper proper dosage there. Whereas if we're going six plus reps, I could have done six, ten. This that load was too light, and we should probably increase that weight next round. So high loads is superior. Obviously, the, the higher you are with your closer to 85% of your one rep max um, is better. Um, but having the high effort with at 50%, being able to put, you know, 12, 12 reps or so. Um, but then also important is the multi-joint exercises. It's not sitting there pumping out extra rotation. It's, you know, lifting overhead because when you're lifting something overhead, your extra rotators are firing. And so it's proper cueing through those movements to, you know, to produce maximal strength gains. So when does it sit to stand, you know, their obturus internus, externus isn't firing as, you know, as it should be. Well, okay, it's going to be firing. I, I can't isolate that, that muscle, but to do, produce th these movements, squats, deadlifts, carries, it is, is it something that 
has to be activated. So it's a, a conducive way to activate the small muscles as, as well as those big movers to allow us to withstand loads throughout life. And just to recap here, load 50-85% of one rep max, looking at three to five reps in reserve, volume two, three sets of six to 12 reps, um, two, three times a week, one to two multi-joint exercises. And these are here on the infographic is a lot of those one to two joint muscle movers, big muscles that can all be applied to our daily functional activities. Lifting something overhead, picking something up off the ground, carrying in the groceries, all applies here. So just some references here. Um, we can review that. But then also I have just a handout kind of discusses what I went over here. And if you reach under your chairs, there is a little question taped to it. It's going to be just kind of help put us in, in, in practice strength training with patients. Yeah. How would you respond to that question? I would say, um, do you have, yeah, is that tolerable? Could you do more? Do you feel like you could do more? Mm -hmm. Not fatigue, not flare up. Mm-hmm. Maybe. And so I, I, more specific, how many more reps do you have in reserve? Yeah. Get a quantifiable number so you know, okay, was that too much, too little? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. I'm good. I'm good. Good. So I threw my bag, bending over time my shoe. How do you expect me to bend over and pick up that weight? Well, what I would say is, okay, like, Walk me through exactly what happened in the work circumstances. Were you holding something while bending over? Were you rotating? That kind of thing. And I'd say if it's if it's your goal, start like squatting and deadlifting, thing, for example, then let's break that thing down. No resistance, no weight. <coughs> let's modify how we're doing things. Put your pain down, get your motion back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. How many times have you tied your shoe before this without throwing your throwing out your back? And so just improving the strength or, you know, like I said, the, the different variables that kind of led up to possibly that happening. It could have been stress or I sat for eight hours right before or, you know, whatever it was. And being able to improve our strength, overall muscle strength to withstand those loads for longer periods of time or whatever it is for those factors is exactly yeah. Uh, education and, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is going to happen to me every time I do it now. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, you get to where you just totally fear picking anything up ever again with the mini weights. And, uh, so to try to get them to get over that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'll go. I can't even move without having pain. How do you expect me to move with weights? So I think we, we hear that quite a bit here because we do a lot of loading. And I think it's not that we're ignoring the pain, but I think I would, I would stress to the patient that movement has been shown by the evidence to be probably your best pain regulator that you have. So obviously maybe that day we're not squatting, you know, 200 pounds, but maybe we find positions in a bridge where they're close to your tilt where it's a little more comfortable or a wall slide with some kind of, you know, just a little bit different pelvic movement. So there's still compound movements. They're still load bearing if they can um, and just gradually work them into that, but still kind of plant to the seed that eventually that'll be, you know, small load that we're going to uh, we will get you to load you know, later on, but you know we're going to start small, mm -hmm. and I think that's for every patient that we see. I mean, they're not jumping right to the barbell immediately. There, there's a week or two of kind of motor prep and just getting the system used to doing that. Um, so I think still instilling that with the patient, but still being okay with, with getting them to do some movements here where they can find positions of relief through active exercise. Whereas I think before I might have thought manual therapy or maybe a modality because they're too flared up where I've changed a lot of my practice just based on compound movements and trying to get them to them. Awesome. Thank you. Ken? So, this lifting weights going to make my high blood pressure go even higher. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, that, you know, if, uh, if you go too progressively, I think, um, or if you progress too quickly, yes, it will, but you should be able to, us being professionals, we're in the best position to be able to do this other than that, leg trainers, to, to be able to regulate some of the vitals and see how the body responds. But if we start progressing, it's shown that when you start applying stresses to the heart and cardiovascular system, uh, in the blood pressure area, the blood pressures will tend to like, adjust yeah. uh, as long as it's done within a safe pace uh, of increasing. Uh, 
and it's also close to the water for those who are less dangerous. No, it'd be better. It'd be more dangerous not to look for it. You've already got black eyes on your head. There you go. Every time you're hard, that's so you're not looking hard. Not blood of your body. So it might even see blood pressure increase with the wrong person you're looking for. Just to add to that, because there was a study that showed uh, they looked at, I think it was males, 40 to 60 or something, and they looked at cause of death be stroke and heart attack. And they basically found that those individuals that lifted weights for about like 45 to 55 minutes a week, it wasn't even like three times, whatever, that was the time frame. If they did heavy resistance work, they were like 45% less likely to die of those two problems, you know, which is huge because you can tell a patient, look, I'm not telling you you have to go to the gym four days a week. You can just bump out a workout 50 minutes, 225 minutes, whatever you want to do. Um, but you have to load. So I think the, the overall cardiovascular component is huge if you're not doing that. So. I have a question. So how do you guys feel about um, the um, home exercise program you give them and tell them to do some of these exercises you're giving them every day? Because, well, sometimes I, I've said that because they're not doing anything, and I'm hoping that they'll do at least three times a week by telling them I want to do at least five to six times a week. Mm -hmm. And I think a good way... I think that's a good way, good good place to start um, to produce the like, neuromuscular feedback to kind of reduce pain, get them okay with moving, because it takes a good six to eight weeks to actually see strength gains. Right. And so doing that for the first week or so to have that movement ingrained, and when you come back next time, hey, we're going to add weight to that now, and then drop you down to two to three times a week. Yeah. And I'll just start to my patients saying, hey, like, Try doing the mobility, the lightweight stuff, stretches, like six to seven times a week at a time. So you don't have time to do that every mm -hmm. day. And then just, I just say, hey, for these heavier resistance-based workouts, you know, one to three times a week, or two to three times a week, mm -hmm. but just do something every day. Walk a little bit every day, too, and get some other stuff done. Just because you're taking the rest of the week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the normal, the general recommendations for physical activity is 150 minutes a week of aerobic exercise and at least two days of strength training. And so, yeah, so that's, you know, basically 30 minutes a day of walking, jogging, or just moving. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Thank you.